So now we'll move on to uh, Rosanna Montiel, uh, who's principal of Rosanna Montiel Estudio de Arquitectura. Um, Rosanna received her BA in architecture from the Universidad Iberoamericana in Mexico City and an MA in architectural theory and criticism from the Universidad Politecnica de Catalunya in Spain. And she teaches at the Universidad Americana, Iberoamericana, her alma mater. Um, so with Rosanna's work, I mean, the jury was really struck by, we, we get, you know, a lot of, um, portfolios from Mexico, and they're all very, very impressive. Uh, but um, Rosanna stood out. Um, the jury was struck by how she was able to enact change in her work through these kind of very surgically precise um, urban operations. I think you'll see that tonight. Um, her work just embodies the term architectural intervention, which gets thrown around a lot in, in absolutely the best way. And when you see the work, sometimes it's very hard to tell where the projects actually end. They just seem into the neighborhoods that they're set into and um, I think are really striking in both their modesty and you can really begin to feel their presence in their communities. So Rosanna, without further ado. So good afternoon, buenas noches. I would like to express my gratitude to the Architectural League Committee for um, granting me the honor to be here tonight with you today, and also to Anne Rieselbach, Matragazzo, Sonil for the introduction. And um, also I would like to thank you to all of the team I work with in Mexico, as Omar also said. I work with a big team of collaborators, interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary collaborators, and so I would like to thank them all. What I will present to you today is the body of work of the past 10 years of collaboration, researching, designing, building, placemaking. As it has been overlapped, overlaid, multiple case studies without a clear definition of where one ends and where one begins. Mexico City, a multiplicity of cities. Almost 120 million Mexicans, 20% of them living in the city and the conurbated area. Urban research, public space in social housing, and mobility are the three main issues that I will talk about tonight. So this is the place where I live, where I work, and where I design. It is this immense mass of hard surface that seems to extend endlessly with undefined boundaries with which, with which to establish parameters of where we can study. Until recently, the population of the city acquired the right of self-governance. This is a historical event. Almost 9 million inhabitants in the city did not have the right to decide about the planning and uses of the city. Urban research. So, by living in a place like I show you, shouldn't we be compelled to try to understand better where we live and where we design? Through intensive research, we have gradually gathered an information of urban studies, an archive that documents different aspects of the city related to topics such as public space and mobility. In such process, we have developed specific tools and a particular methodology to approach urban projects. And after all that, what we learn is to allow serendipity to happen. Mostly at the beginning of any project, we methodically provoke randomness to intrude. And when it does, we listen carefully. We look closer, we imagine, we act. The next four case studies Will, that I'm going to show you are related to the city in the following way. Multiplicity. Multiplicity does a reading of the city in its multiple scales, layers, connections, and networks. Multiplicity redraws the city to find new ways of mapping space flows. More than mere maps, the result is a matrix of system that crosses data 
to allow a sequence of lectures and simultaneous events happen. Vacant City opens new possibilities to investigate underused spaces and the potential they have to be reused. With the map of the city, With the map of the city, we drew a circle in the center, which turns out to be a route called Circuito Interior, an internal circuit. So what we did was mapped all the derelict spaces, and we found hundreds of them. So we start doing urban actions to provoke as a provocation and to start uh, finding new ways, ways of occupying these spaces. So the first action, we call it Se Ocupa. It's to occupy. And um, squats through this urban intervention, focusing on a photographic record of all the underused spaces as an example of the amount of spaces that could be reoccupied with new uses and programs. So um, we uh, made a tarp where we usually do these tarps to, to sell or to rent. They use it for that. So we did this tarp that said Se Ocupa and we put it in all those derelict spaces and um, took photographs to see how people react with this. And after that urban action, another action came called Melate Tulote. So this is a game of words in Spanish, so it's different, difficult to translate it, but it's, uh, I like your plot. And uh, it's a, a temporary intervention of space. So um, this action shows the possibility of an underused space becoming temporary public property. So here we manage to get this plot. We manage to with the owner. Um, they use it during the weekdays as a parking lot. And in the week weekends, it was underused. It was not used. So we decided to use them during the we weekends for different activities. City out of line. City out of line develops new public spaces from the most ephemeral and determining, determining tool in architecture design, the line. This action explores and documents the potential of a line, uses a tool of spatial design to construct, deconstruct, work and rework different perceptions of urban space out of line, one line, manages the ima imaginative potential of a place by capitalizing on its temporary uses. A single line <coughs> can reveal the perception of the space, its costumes and habits, the place's memory, and most importantly, it can reveal the whole community. We did this with masking tape, we have done it with limestone, and we have done very different interventions with the line because it, I think it's a very powerful tool, very simple but very powerful. So it also shifts the border between the private and public domain, interior and exterior. To mark with a single line and edge, to see how the limits are where the borders, how space was organized or is organized, and the relationship between street, public space, and private space. The line shapes the community's participation in its own making. It makes the invisible visible. In order to achieve place making, people caring and perhaps even willing to commit to their public well being. It also works by resonance and produces an overall change of perception of space. The line is a public event that changes the local atmosphere by way of ephemeral lod logic, engaging activities with the regular public. This recent action we did is part of our proposal for the Venice Biennale with Alejandro Aravena in a community in Iztapalapa called Miravalle. Object City finds through objects a new perception of the city, creates a new way of looking at the city through everyday objects in the urban scene. A drain, a mirror, a gallon water bottle, a funnel, a grill, a ladder, an antenna, a huacal, a door, 
a window, a tire. Those are alternatives of domestic objects, urban elements, and how we can recycle them, how we can transform, how we can resignify them. Public space in social housing. So as you can see, the context where I live, Mexico City is completely different from where Mar works. You know, the landscape totally different. But very interesting in both sides. So behind this uniform facade of identical pink homes hides a serious problematic of social integration. Alcoholism, gangs, drug trafficking, lack of education and healthcare, and social and structural violence. A lot of these complexes are dormitory areas that are isolated and marginalized. They were designed relying on the use of the automobile, which most of the inhabitants don't have. This is a world of people doomed to live in extremely problematic conditions, largely due to a lack of public space, or what is the same, a need for placemaking. According to the National Works Workers Housing Funding Institute, Colin Fonavit, 70% of what is built today in Mexico is housing, and 25% of the city's population live in social housing units. So in the last years, architect Carlos Cedillo, deputy di director, head of sustainability of Infonavit, and all his team, with whom we have been collaborating closely, have made an enormous effort to introduce new programs of public space in social housing rehabilitation, as well as developing new concepts in, for housing. So the next projects I'm going to show, the next two projects I'm going to show are interventions done in public space, housing, with very different typologies. The first one is located in um, multifamiliar, what we call multifamiliar um, housing, and it's called comunidad. It's difficult to translate, but it, the translation would be common unity. So, as an architect, I am interested in designing placemaking rather than producing made places. Placemaking is an ongoing process while a placemate is a product. I put special emphasis on this because space design that facilitates the production of place through community engagement is key in the activation and sustenance of public space. Public space, as we know, is an anchor for resilience and equity in society. It gets people reinvested in their place. This is urban acupuncture because through low cost, medium scale, well designed, meaningful interventions on different layers, we achieve large scale renewal and development. The ripple effect is long term and becomes an economic driver. These projects are more representative of what I consider in placemaking. All of them are public space interventions that achieve community engagement and act as a detonator of change. So we draw this post-it, this is our collection of post-its, we have many more, and we approach the site and start drawing and redrawing. I think when you redraw something, you start to understand the place. Redrawing transforms reality. Comunidad, Jalpa. Comunidad is an intervention done in a place called San Pablo, Jalpa, which has approximately 7,000 inhabitants and is located in the north part of Mexico City. Urban housing units like Jalpa have the advantage of being inserted among densely serviced urban surroundings and are better alternatives to modern housing sprawls. The goal was to transform the housing unit into a community of neighbors, what we call a common unity or actual unity within the unit. For this, we needed to work around the barriers created by the inhabitants in order to make them permeable, democratic, and meaningful. What we found was a section housing unit where zoning and access had been altered through fences and barriers, built by the inhabitants over time. 
public space had been invaded for private uses, was underused or simply inexistent. We rehabilitated four public areas in, and the spaces in between. As you can see in the image, most of the common areas were privatized. It was extremely important to design with the community and not for the community through the implementation of actions and workshops. One of the actions we did was called Lona Pizarron, or the map wall. And um, these are the walls that have been put through the years before they didn't exist for security, for protecting each sector in San Pablo Jalpa. And so um, we asked the community what their ideas were about this space by hanging a white plastic tarp with a legend. I would use this space too. And we left it there for a week. And so the ideas of all the inhabitants came out. They were really with the urgency of doing something in those spaces. After that, we made another action called map out queries. And the objective of these map out queries is drawing out important qualitative, more than quantitative, uh, information about the specific uses by appealing to the inhabitants' memories and emotions rather than to their rationale. So examples of the questions were, where did you learn to ride your bike? Where do you normally hang out? Where did you give your first kiss? What places are scary? And the response of the public was very positive. And the most important result was that we built trust. So trust was the touchstone for all that we could change. They usually also put some plastic tarps during the weekends. They use them a lot. So we took this idea for creating uh, covered public recreational and socializing, socializing areas. And after a while of being there, 90% of the barriers were removed by the community. So at first, these barriers were untouchable. There was no way we could take took out the fences. And after, the, the community was the one that decided to take them all out. So um, we focus on developing integral, low-cost improvement of public space and gave back to the people a sense of community. We use very simple materials, again, with the idea of re-signifying elements and make them speak a new language. Um, that we design integral patios where we install roof modules equipped for different activities and design different pavements, some of them permeable to avoid flooding. And we use different panels for blackboards, climbing walls and nets, handrails, ropes and rings, parallels and monkey bars to make it a multifunctional space. And this is how it looks. So the recovered public space in Jalpa somehow became an extension of each apartment while it remained free to the public. The strategy turned out to be efficient. People got together to redesign their unit. In terms of this design, the key aspect in our strategy was the use of horizontal surfaces to convey the idea of sheltering instead of dividing. By eliminating vertical structures such as walls, barriers, and fences, the HALPA project got the community on the same roof, so to speak. We provided the space for the community to voice its needs and create consensus. And the result was they finally took ownership and pride of their space. As of today, the intervened areas show constant activity throughout the day. People sw sweep the space early in the morning when they before didn't even know each other. Young people come and exercise, ladies sit in the, their knitting club, old folks play chess. There are school tutoring classes, Zumba and yoga classes every night, parties, religious celebrations. The change was such that even free Wi-Fi was installed and now people gather around to work with their laptops. There are night open air cinema shows. 
So this has their real the apartments are really small, so they don't have a place where to be. And now this space is full of activities, as I told you before. So um, the the other space we found in this Halpa unit was an old leaky shed that they call El Saloncito, that was already in use as a multi-purpose room for school tutoring, knitting, clubs, and also religious instructions. The intervention brought out all the potential to the new space in the same place. We couldn't move it, so in the same space, we did this. The people wanted to enlarge the room to expand their activity programs. So we re redesigned it all together to make it a functional, warm space, taking into account their programs and activities. A bookstore donated an important collection of children's books, and this became a library. So we went from a leaky warehouse to a sunny library reading room. Here's my daughter, Hannah, taking part of the activities, which she's also present here today, very happy. <laughs> Rehabilitating public space restored the community's use of public space. It transformed the unity into common unity. Place making was the result of understanding the temporality and uses of space, as well as the diversity of the public likely to attend a place. This next project is rooftop. We were asked by Infonavit to build a roof sports court in response to the inhabitants' constant request. This project was done in collaboration with the architect Aline Wallach, as the same as Halpa. And this project is not located in Mexico City. It's located in Veracruz, near the Gulf Coast, in the Gulf Coast of Mexico. It's a suburban townhouse typology which has also an essential problem of a lack of public space. The Veracruz housing unit has been planned for 25,000 inhabitants. And the area we designed to build the roof was of 8,500 square feet. So they just gave us a very, very small area. And the basketball court already existed but because it remained on cover and it was out, it was out of use. In Veracruz, there are like the climate is very extreme. Sometimes it could get until 104 Fahrenheit degrees. So due to extreme exposure to sun, heat, and rain, semi indoor spaces are necessary. We designed this by re reactivating the space into a place. As I explained before, we only had very, a very few area where to, to do it, just the court. Later, we negotiated this ad additional area to complete the sports court with a plaza. What we did was that we used um, the area between the columns to insert capacities for multi-use rooms, library, bathrooms, outlooks, playground area, hammock and swing sections, adult fitness area, terraces, a forum, and a picnic area. We, oh, this is part of the design. So in this case, our greatest achievement was to convince the developer to understand such space as more than a mere basketball court. You could say he placed emphasis on the roof and we placed emphasis in the program beneath the roof. So the what was really interesting is that every time we came there to visit the construction, the builders were sitting drinking a Coke and they were not working. And so we said, well, at what time do they work? And after a little while that while we were there, I was the same. I was sitting, drinking a Coke with them because it was impossible to do anything with that really extreme weather. So with this, you can understand that the, the quality of, of the spaces is 
very difficult to manage, like good quality of construction because of builders not being able to do their work correctly. But it was really, really interesting that they put, they were, they've never seen a design like that, so we, they were interested in doing it, and then they really did a good job with the quality of the, of the space. So for the studio, materiality is an essential aspect of placemaking because it affects our perception of space. So we pay particular attention to details. We experiment with materials in their natural state and are coherent with the vernacular structure and aesthetic particulars of the site. We design the construction process also, again, to resignify low-cost materials. We had also very, very low budget for doing this project. So we use simple materials as a concrete lattice, cinder block, introduce local vegetation to create a cooler atmosphere. The result was that the developer and its people could finally see the project as more than a sports court. The space was, des was designed as a multifunctional housing many activities despite its size. Children that used to roam aimlessly around the housing unit now have a place to go and be. We spent a whole weekend taking pictures and looking what went on when it was already finished. And we were amazed to see that all the kids were there and they didn't want to go. They came really early and they left really late at night. The parents weren't around, but now they were really happy doing a lot of activities there. Reading on the outside, doing activities in the inside, even getting free haircuts. They were the first ones to get the, the haircut, their free haircuts. Doing Zumba classes, and as in Jalpa, they do now religious things, they do many activities, parties. They have football tournaments at night. Even a biologist in the area has proposed to make a herbal medical center with a small botanical garden where the community will be taught the benefits of the local plants. So our, our touchstone for placemaking in this case was planting the vision of a habitat. The Porticus Agora design produced a recreational space with the potential to harbor an entire community center. The resulting spaces are filled with life. Understanding the factors that, that can expand the program and uses of a site from the perspective of its temporal and multifunctional uses to transform it into a place with identity and character as a community. And the last topic I will talk about is mobility. So the next three and last projects I will present are about different types of, of mobility, from displacement to placemaking, walking, ambling, commuting, boy temple. Three million people walk the pilgrim's route during Holy Week along the 117 kilometers route between Ameca and Talpa de Allende that takes place every year to see the bridging El Rosario in Jalisco. They displace no matter what for four to five days from all ages in a very radical topography. 200 years of tradition of this pilgrimage with very bad conditions of infrastructure. Devote people return year after year. So we designed a circle, a hermit, a public space project in the middle of the woods. This project done in collaboration with Delecamp Arquitectos is a circle that represents a space as a place for contemplation, a temple containing the macrocosmos within the microcosmos. The white concrete wall, a 40 meter diameter circle is a piece place in between pine trees that blends in with the particular topography of the site. Suspended three meters high, it follows the terrain slopes and elevation, and it is buried at different points to respect horizontality. 
as a temple, the white wall delimit delimitates a space for contemplation. It contains the visitor intimately relating with nature. It is a privileged place to understand the totality of the natural world on human scale. It is a landmark in the memory of the pilgrim's walk. In this project, placemaking is about creating an architectonic ecotone. As a transitional space, the ecotone negotiates the public and private sphere, tempers the move from open zones to enclosures, and allows respectful coexistence of build-up and natural areas. Displacement manages mobility and regulates time shifts in the uses of space. Ambling City understands mobility and alternative uses of urban space seen through the eyes of street peddlers with their transportation, itineraries, harangues, sounds, trade and product, and temporal uses of their public space. City to go is every day more visible in the city. Street peddlers go to you with whatever you need. We gave them disposable cameras to the street ped peddlers and um, they start taking photographs about their daily routines and the, the photographs that came out were really, really interesting. So we were interested in you know, like recording all what they did to for their movement every day. In a city with 22 million people, it takes time getting places. Most people give up on their quality of life because they spend, in average, six hours a day in transportation. And because they don't have another option, it's about surviving. <laughs> people commute four hours every day. They spend between three to four hours in transportation, and they still have a happy face in their jobs. Rush hours in the subway can become a nightmare. 4.6 million people travel daily by the subway. This last project is called Metropolis. It's a proposal of how it would be possible to reactivate public space throughout Mexico City by catapulting the subway system of Mexico City in a dense network of multi-service hubs. Metropolis was the result of a happy find. It was literally an objet trouvé. We were doing this photographic documentation on these used spaces and abandoned objects around the city and realized back in the studio that there was a building we had photographed several times, or so we thought, with this iconic window that repeats hundreds of times. It turned out that this building, ha uh, we discovered that this building was not just one building, it was, there were 22 buildings and besides their characteristic structure, they all had in common being connected to the public transportation system. So I think that I this is unique in the world that 22 buildings are connected to public transportation and are really on top of the, of the subway. The project envisions the life of a city all in one building, happening within a network of buildings around the city. In other words, by housing an entire city within its network, the subway would catapult Mexico City into a new era of mobility. Millions of people traveling every day, interconnecting between the different subway lines. Another positive thing about these buildings is that they have an open plan, so they can be used in many different ways to become multifunctional, multidynamic. Once these buildings are rehabilitated to provide services of entertainment, culture, sports, work hubs, commerce, and health, they will maximize the potential of the public transportation network as an integral multi-service network. Metropolis turns the logic of going places on its head. People move around their routines and places go meet them on their way home or on their way to work. 
the fact that these buildings have the potential to become service hubs and they are all connected by the transportation system gives the subway network the potential to substantially impact the overall well-being of a city. The project, which has garnered interest from both the public and private sectors, works on multiple scales of design, floor plans, building plans, and network plan. It also comprises different layers of the city, underground, street level, outlooks, and rooftops. But its key aspect is that it understands the temporal uses and fluxes in space. I have to point out that this type of mobility could potentially redefine the core urban identity of the city. A healthy city, a safety city, all thanks to the subway metro network. Place making in this project is ultimately about connectedness. So Metropolis is an urban recycling proposal designed to build a meaningful collective experience. The following video is a perfect metaphor of the subway wagon that becomes the structure of the building network. Then the building network becomes the city. Wouldn't, be a, wouldn't it be amazing to shop and exercise and attend regular medical checkups in our way to work as if these services were provided all in the same subway wagon? I conclude by saying that urban planning is about placemaking. And placemaking is about understanding architecture as a social construction. More than following a line of design, it is seeing the potential of a line in design to become a vector, a force. When we activate that force, we organize, mobilize, we generate change. I believe that once a public space is rehabilitated, more of this follow, because something very positive is set in motion. Trust, hope, enthusiasm, ownership, all the necessary ingredients to detonate potential and create a new social fabric. What we really accomplish through design is enabling a community's voice to emerge. They have become the emerging voices. Thank you very much. <laughs>